Aviation writer and plane and pilot consultant Tim Kern sat down with aviation legend Pete Law. They talked about everything from Pete's time at the Lockheed Skunk Works to what he does here with the airplanes at Reno for ADI and carburation. And one of the things too, the, the sizes of these engines are uh, phenomenal to those of us that deal in, in, in what we call the real world. Uh, when you're talking about uh, a 3350, you mean 3350 cubic inches. Now that's roughly twice the size of an Allison or a Merlin V12, which is also a huge, monstrous engine. So when you say one and a half times, that's all you can get out of a 3350. Uh, you're talking some monumental horsepower numbers. Well, if you can do it right, you can get up the 4,500 horsepower, which Michael Brown did attain once, but unfortunately it didn't last too long. But I would say in the order of uh, the right 3350 that's in rear bear right now can easily go to 3,600 horsepower. And, and, and that's a couple hundred more than a Merlin's going to be able to come up with. Right. They can come up with 3,000. The 3350s can come up with about 37 to 3,800. And the 4360 can get up to, since it's 4,360 cubic inches, it's very large. It's like a, it'd be like a 400, 40, 429 Chevy multiplied by 10. Or a Ford, but well, I can't remember which one's Ford, the Ford 429. Ford 429, Chevy yeah. 427. Yeah, okay, well, they multiply that by 10, and that's what a 4360. It'll put out stock on a C124 transport airplane, it'll stock put out 3,800 horsepower. And we can boost it up easily to 42, 4,300 horsepower with the right amount of water injection and the right amount of cooling on the cylinders and the right amount of cooling of all the oil and everything else. And, and how many cylinders are we talking about? Okay, a 4360 has 28 cylinders. It has two spark plugs per cylinder, so you're talking about 56 spark plugs. You're talking about four magnetos. Each spark plug has a coil, so you're talking about 56 coils. Now, a 3350 has 18 cylinders and uh, you have 36 spark plugs there, and they have two spark plugs per coil, so you only have uh, uh, 18 coils there, but you also have four, four magnetos on that. So, so even with the smaller 3350, you're dealing with a $2,000 spark plug change. Yes, that is correct. And the R2800 was the one that we started off with on Daryl Greenmeyer's Bearcat. We were able to get 3,000 horsepower of his R2800. It was normally a 2,400 power, horsepower airplane, but we had Pratt & Whitney helping us because while I was working on the A12 SR71, Pratt & Whitney engineers were developing the J58 engine for the SR71 so we could go 2,000 miles an hour. They were helping us with all the work that they had done back on the R2800 and told us what the limits were. Now, Lyle, after Darrell set the world speed record with the R2800, which is 2,800 cubic inches, he decided to go to a bigger engine because he knew he'd never beat Darrell with, with an R2800. But right now, there's a yak out here called Checkmate that has an R2800 that just qualified at 466 miles an hour, which is a very small airplane with a very large engine and a very good pilot and several years of engineering calculations to get that whole thing to work, which I've been involved with. They got it up to 466 miles an hour. And Steve Hinton Jr. just qualified at 486, his first fast ride in, in Strega. That's, that's remarkable. And the, the Checkmate uh, changes were not really to the power plant so much. They were uh, wing skins and uh, carbon fillets in the, in the tail section and a new cowling and uh, gear doors that finally stayed shut and things that really made a difference. And, and if I recall, they're about 20 miles an hour faster than they were last year, yes. and they were really fast last well, year. They did several things. Uh, Ray Anderson built them a new engine, and they were able to find a way to get rid of 400 pounds in the airplane. And on a light airplane, 400 pounds is a lot because the drag, as you're going around due to lift, uh, when you're pulling three and four Gs, it's considerable. 400 pounds is a lot when you're pulling four Gs. That's, uh, and that had to do with streamlining the ADI system and the water system and uh, a number of other things. Uh, I did get a kind of a Cook's tour of uh, the changes on Checkmate this year, and it, it's okay. a truly remarkable airplane. It looks very similar to how it always looked, but it's, uh, it has a whole new personality. One thing that you were asking about is what, what might we want to do in the future? Well, Daryl Greenemar and Bruce Boland had designed an airplane called Shockwave, and it is sitting outside there. It was a, a home-built center section of the wing and fuselage 
with uh, C Fury outer wing panels and an R4360 on the front and F86 tail, streamlined tail for less drag. And Bruce had, in, had calculated that the speed of that airplane, when it would finally fly with everything working properly, would have been 555 miles an hour. That would be the speed record type. type and, that, and that would be the fastest lap ever flown here. The fastest lap now is 538, and that's with a jet. Yes. Well, it would, that would have been a, for the straight and line speed record, and it would probably have been able to go about 520 or 530 around the pylons, which is remarkable for, a, for about a 10,000-pound airplane. And that piece is outside, and if we, can, if we can get the crew out there, maybe we can take a picture of, uh, of that chassis. Yes. And, of course, a couple of the other airplanes that, are, that, are, that, have, that I've been working on just recently to improve them was, was Rare Bear. We were trying to make that one a little bit better, and uh, we're still having our growing pains with that one. <laughs> I hope I, we'll get it all straightened out. As of this morning, Rare Bear was going to fly this afternoon. Is that yes. still operative? Yes, yes, he will fly this afternoon. And Rare Bear uh, has won here uh, six times, I believe, and uh, also has, uh, has a number of other speed records, time to climb records. Uh, it has one time to climb record now, still. Uh, zero to a thousand meters, I believe. But uh, anyway, Rare Bear is, is quite a machine. However, he went out the other day and was turning uh, some pretty good times for a super sport class, which is about 100 miles an hour slower than that airplane's capable of going. So there was something very wrong with Rare Bear, and uh, I don't want to talk about what I think I know, because they'll have it fixed by the time I talk about it. I agree. We better. <laughs> We're going to be in trouble. So anyway, I, uh, I've had a lot of good experiences with a lot of good people, and uh, my knowledge from Lockheed has helped me a lot in a lot of things we have done on the SR-71 and the U-2 and the F-117 and the F-35, X-35, and quite a few things that I can't talk about. It has have taught me an awful lot about things in engineering that most people don't want to apply to this kind of racing because they're afraid that they don't know enough about their past history, and that's why my entire career, all 46 years I've been here at the, at the, uh, at the air races, are, are invaluable to those people. And I've tried to retire several times, but they tell me I can't. They didn't give me permission. What, uh, you know, Reno is based on uh, tradition a lot, uh, a lot, and uh, there's some science as well, and there's an awful lot of enthusiasm. Uh, there's some amount of money, of course, thrown in as well that keeps everything going. One of the things, though, about tradition is that bad traditions continue as well, and I'm talking about bad engineering traditions. Do you want to go over some of the, uh, some of the things that people just know are right that are wrong? Well, I, I, unless I have specific examples, it's hard because there's so many things running ar around in my mind that I've done that I've done right and some people haven't done right. I'll, I'll give you some. Okay. Okay, why um, they go from esoteric to just plain crazy. But a lot of people think that more compression means more horsepower, regardless of anything else. Actually, what makes more horsepower is airflow. What you try to do is get the most amount of airflow and to the right temperature and expand it properly, and you will find you have the more, most horsepower. It's air is horsepower. Air is horsepower. Bigger exhaust pipes mean the engine will breathe better. That is correct. But if you shrink the exhaust stacks down a little bit, you can get thrust out of them. Now, Bruce Bowman went back and calculated in the old days that if you size the exhaust stacks correctly, you can get 10% of the engine's horsepower as thrust from the stacks, which means in a 3,000 horsepower engine, you can get 300 horsepower's worth of thrust out of the engine. And how much other power is wasted that goes into that engine that doesn't come out as horsepower to turn the prop? Well, an awful lot's wasted out the exhaust. Just plain old thermodynamic cycles. You can't get, you can't get as much efficiency out of one of those piston engines as you want to or could be able to. That's where compression ratio helps. But compression ratio doesn't help you if it means you can't burn the, with the, uh, the combustion mixture without detonating it and burning the piston. So there's a limit you can go in compression ratio. It's better to reduce the compression ratio and supercharge and get more airflow into it it's because it's what it gets in, not how, how, how high it gets compressed. High compression ratios give you good efficiency, but high amounts of airflow in a cylinder give you more horsepower. 